When we read the scriptures or hear them read to us, as we heard a few minutes ago, we need to remember that what we're hearing is something that was written almost 2,000 years ago to people back in the, in the early church, in the time of Jesus, the time of Paul. And yet it still speaks to us in amazing ways today. You know, there was a lot of love in that early first century church. And we see a typical expression of that in these opening letters, letter to the Philippians, the opening lines of Philippians that Anne just read to us a moment ago. And we need to remember the setting also in which Philippians was written because that makes it an even more amazing letter, probably my favorite, one of my favorite letters in the New Testament. But remember, it has been 10 to 12 years since Paul has seen the people at the church at Philippi. And Paul is in prison now, probably in Rome. He's not sure what's going to happen to him, whether he will live or whether he will die. But the people in, in Philippi and the church there had not forgotten Paul. In fact, they have sent a gift to him there in prison. And in his letter, Paul is writing to them, thanking them for the gift. But much more than that, he is thanking them for the great expression of love that it represents. He knows that he will most likely not see them again, but he hasn't and he will never forget them. So Paul says in the opening lines of this letter, how he thanks God for every memory he has of them. He says, I am thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. I am thankful for all of your good work. The Philippian church had remained faithful to the gospel in spite of the hard times, in spite of the persecution that they faced. He says, I am thankful that you have stood by me. And this is evident once again, as they have sent this gift to him in prison just like it is with us and with certain people that we meet along the way on the journey of life, Paul knows he will never see them again in this world. He hasn't seen them in over a decade, but he will never forget them and will always be grateful for them. They have touched and shaped and affected his life in ways that he will never forget. And so he says he thanks God with joy for every remembrance of them. Who have you known along the way in your life that affect you in the same way? And that you thank God with joy for every memory of them. This, of course, is Memorial Day weekend, and Memorial Day was originally established to remember and honor those who have given their lives for their country during times of war. And we should never forget those who died to protect and preserve the freedoms that we continue to enjoy today. But this Sunday before Memorial Day, has become in the church a day in which we remember all that we have known and loved who are no longer with us in this world, including and especially members of our church who have died to this life since last Memorial Day. Their spirit will always be with us, always be a part of us. And so many of them have touched our lives in ways that we will never forget. But I ask you this morning, who do you remember the most? And why do you remember them? It's interesting how emails seem to dominate our lives today, not only our daily lives, but sometimes our hourly and minute lives, it seems. But I still have an email I received about five years ago because its message was so very powerful. The email said, can you name the five wealthiest people in the world? 
Can you name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? Can you name the last five winners of the Miss America contest? Or the last half dozen Academy Award winners? Can you name 10 people who have won a Nobel or Pulitzer Prize? The point is that the rich and the famous are quickly forgotten like yesterday's headlines. But those who have truly touched and shaped and influenced our lives, like Paul with the Philippians, will never be forgotten, but always remembered with joy. And then to prove this, the email went on to say that we remember most the teachers who have shaped our journey through school. And we were so greatly affected and influenced by them. I'll bet you can remember your teachers in your younger years, especially. I know I still remember mine. I still know their names. I can still see their faces. Mrs. Flannery, white haired, my first grade teacher, taught me how to write, taught me how to love school. Miss Davis, my second grade teacher, taught me to write cursively. And I also had a crush on her. <laughs> Mrs. Heasley, my third grade teacher, taught me to love poetry. I had a crush on her too. <laughs> Mrs. Smith, my fourth grade teacher, I didn't have a crush on her because she looked like an army sergeant. <laughs> but she taught me a lot. And I'll never forget that across the back wall of that fourth grade classroom was every edition of National Geographic magazine that was ever printed. And we loved looking through those magazines. Mrs. Wall was my fifth grade teacher. Mrs. Packard, my sixth grade teacher. She was also the school principal. So the people you never forget are the people who make the greatest difference in your life. And they're not the ones who have the greatest credentials or the most money or the most awards, but they're the ones who truly cared and you, and you knew it. Besides teachers, scout leaders, I remember mine, or coaches, or even ministers, especially youth ministers you may have had when you were young. We remember most those who have helped us through difficult times. We remember most those who have made us feel appreciated and special. We remember those with whom we enjoy spending time. We remember most heroes who inspire us. Winston Churchill has always been one of my greatest heroes. He saved England and probably the world twice from war. He led them to victory in war. And then they rewarded him each time by immediately voting him out of office. In ministry, my greatest hero has always been Harry Emerson Fosdick. He's long been gone from this world but not forgotten by a long shot. Fosdick was way ahead of his time. He died back in 1969, but he continues to speak to me today through his writings and, and through his sermons that he published. He influenced my early ministry probably more than any other single person I know of, more than any living preacher today. There are other men and women of great faith and of bold, committed Christian leadership whom I'll never forget and for whom I always feel great joy when I think of them. And the ones I remember the most are the ones who made the greatest difference. And many of them were members of this church. Those who have died in this life may be gone from us, but they're still a very big part of us. They are more than just a memory, wonderful though that memory is. As somebody once wrote, in one sense there is no death. The life of a soul on earth lasts beyond his or her departure. You will always feel that life touching yours, that voice speaking to you, that spirit looking at you through other eyes, talking to you in familiar things that he or she touched, worked with, loved, and through familiar friends. 
They still live in our lives and in the lives of all others who knew them while they were here. Or as David Henry Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau once wrote, even the death of friends will inspire us as much as their lives. But now let me switch gears on this Memorial Sunday. Let me say something you don't want to hear. At least most people don't seem to want to hear it, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Someday you will be gone from this earth. Someday your name will be on a list in the church bulletin or a flower placed in your loving memory. And when that time comes, how are you going to be remembered? And for what will you be remembered? And years, years after you die, will you still be remembered at all? Will you be remembered with joy? Like Paul remembers the Philippians. And again, for what? As Clay has been talking about this month in his sermons on the second mountain, the people who are remembered with joy the most are the people who have discovered and climbed that second mountain and not just got stuck on the first mountain. But will you be remembered as a person who truly cares? Cares about what? Cares about whom? As we remember the, the 14 members of Woodmont who have died to this life since Memorial Day last year, which ones do you remember the most and, and why? I remember Al Richardson, always the life of the party, always so much fun to be around. But nobody loved Woodmont Christian Church any more than Al Richardson loved it. Or Moulton Ferrer, who moved to his cabin up on Kentucky Lake the last couple of years of his life when he could no longer get around. But every time I'd call him and talk to him on the phone, he always ended the phone call with saying two things. I love you, man. And grown old ain't for sissies. And he was right. Or Maurice Pinson who took care of this church's property insurance for decades uh, and who had so many pearls of wisdom for life that he liked to share. Like, do something, even if it's wrong. Or, I may have been born at night, but not last night. Be a loyal friend to all those you call your friends in life. And I like this one, he says, call your friends. Do not be so rude to text or email them. Boy, I know you say that comes out of a past generation, but maybe some things out of the past we need to regain in the present. So how will you be remembered someday when your name's on the Memorial Day bulletin? Will you be remembered as someone who gives? You know, there are an amazing number of people in this church who generously share their time and their resources to make the mission of Christ possible. Of course, there are many others who don't. Which way will you be remembered? Will you be remembered as someone who always gave a Christian witness? It's one thing to come here and sit and worship on Sunday morning, but it's another thing to worship God during the week by the way you live every day particularly in the way you treat every other person with whom you come into contact. The scriptures tell us that the memory of the righteous is a blessing. So will you not only bless the lives of others while you are here, but also after you are gone? Paul tells the Philippians how much joy it brings to him to remember how they proclaimed and how they defended and lived the gospel of Christ. Will you be remembered as someone who was always positive in your spirit and your attitude? We all know what a difference a positive attitude makes. We love to be around people who are always positive, optimistic, and enthusiastic. They make you feel good just, just being in their presence. You love to see them coming. But then don't we try to avoid those who are always gloomy or pessimistic or cynical. 
You know, some people can find something wrong in every situation, no matter what. I'm sure they'll probably find something wrong in heaven someday, if they ever get there. So how will you be remembered? Will you be remembered as a, a leader who had influence, who made a difference? You know, it's not easy being a leader, particularly it seems in our world today. That's why so many people burn out or drop out or, or never get into the arena to begin with. Others are so concerned with their own personal issues that they aren't willing to make the commitment of time and energy to be a leader. Matthew Kelly wrote a book called The Rhythm of Life. And in it he says, among many other things, when the world is in transition as ours is today, two kinds of people emerge, critics and leaders. Critics are those who criticize everything and everyone. They criticize the old, they criticize the new, they criticize change. They criticize change when it's not happening fast enough. They criticize change when it happens too fast. He says, when do critics ever usher in a new movement in history? Never. Maybe we ought to send that up to Congress and put them to the test. On the other hand, there are leaders. There are men and women of vision and courage and persistence and confidence and generosity, conscience, integrity, creativity, enthusiasm, character and virtue, or what Clay has been talking about in terms of the second mountain. Although I really like to think that the second mountain, that's a great 21st century name for what Jesus called the kingdom of God a long time ago. Leaders are the ones that we long remember and appreciate because they make a difference. You never hear them criticizing anything or anyone because they're too busy getting the job done. Leaders are the ones to whom the future belongs. But as Lee Iacocca said 20 years ago in his book on leadership, he simply said, where have all the leaders gone? Where are the leaders today? Which will you be remembered for, being a critic or a leader? And lastly, will you be remembered as being a true friend? and a true friend, again, because you've moved to the second mountain of life. A true friend is someone who is there for others no matter what. As somebody once said, a true friend is someone who walks in when the rest of the world walks out. And Paul writes to the Philippians how he remembers with joy their true friendship. They stayed with him through hardship, through persecution, and now even during his imprisonment, they're still with him through the gift they sent and the messenger who brought it. You know, it's been said that one such true friend in a lifetime is many. One, excuse me, one is much, two are many, and three are hardly possible. How many such true friends do you have? And to how many people are you such a true friend. Will you be remembered that way? An 18th century philosopher by the name of Etienne Grule once wrote, I shall pass through this world but once, if therefore there be any kindness I can show or any good thing that I can do for any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer it nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. If you choose to live your life according to that philosophy, you will be remembered with joy long after you are gone. Amen.